Hi, I'm Elliot, a writer, and I'm typing out The Great Gatsby. Why? Because that was something Hunter S. Thompson did because he wanted to see what it would be like to write a masterpiece. Now that I've started this project seven months ago, I need to finish it. So join me every Saturday until I finish this whole novel. Gatsby or treat. That's the thing, right? Welcome back to another episode of Typing Out the Great Gatsby. I'm glad you chose Gatsby over treats. Different Halloween candy here. Kit Kats are my favorite. Smarties are a close second because <clears throat> I like to judge my candy on the amount of time it takes me to eat it. I feel like Smarties, you get a lot of, get a lot of value from it. Kind of put individual ones in your mouth. Or you could be a monster and just like. Anyways, let me know what's your favorite candy. Um, it's always a contentious conversation, isn't it? <laughs> it's just like politics, right? It become very tribal about what we like and what we believe in. And um, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. You know what? Don't tell me what your favorite candy is because nothing will change my mind. I'm set in my ways. Give me a break. All right, that was my little bit about Halloween candy. Now let's talk about Gatsby. Here we are, another episode. We are almost there, folks. It's been a wild ride, a wild ride. It's been a wild ride filled with ups and downs, spinning around. It's like both spinning and going up and down. It's one of those crazy roller coaster rides that really messes you up. Um, like, oh man, the G's and the centrifugal force. OMG, OMG. I miss, I miss being on a roller coaster. It's been a while, but good thing I got Gatsby. And this has been a roller coaster of emotions in terms of uh, what we've gone through with these characters, right? And we're nearing the end. Um, there might be one more bump or so. We've taken our picture, like, ah! We've taken that picture, and here we are. Um, a lot has happened in the world. Um, elections tragedies but let's let's not even talk about that stuff let's not even talk about that stuff that's not what you're here for let's talk about Gatsby let's let's just get right to it let's just start our episode um, so previously on typing out the great Gatsby this chapter has been kind of clunky ever since we've you know Things kind of went off the rails when they went to New York and got into that car accident. Well, accident. And um, Gatsby has um, fled the scene of the crime. And now Nick is kind of dealing with his own, um, you know, guilt, I guess you could say, of whether to be there for his friend Gatsby or I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know what he's gonna do. He's kind of debating that right now. So this chapter has been a very conflicted Nick. And um, yeah, yeah. And in terms of our intentions with this episode is, let me think, I, I really didn't prepare. I guess we could figure out how this chapter ends. That's always a good one. How to wrap up a chapter. Um, we'll just look at 
this then that here and there and uh, we'll wrap it up so here we are I believe we are I don't know where we are. oh we're at the scene of the crime <laughs> where this Wilson character is um, dealing with the fact that his wife is now dead so that's where we are so let's like I mentioned this chapter has been kind of all over the place I don't know I'm not a big fan of this chapter but we're here to learn here to be open-minded let's see how it wraps up <laughs> I guess you could say the same thing about this whole series that it's it's all over the place right Ah, <laughs> uh, church. This part is kind of weird. Obviously, we don't care about what this George character um, is kind of doing in terms of deciding to go to a church or not. It's just kind of doing the show don't tell of um, what this character is actually feeling because that's the mo more important thing. We don't care if he's going to church, but we're kind of getting the, the sense of the scene that this George Wilson character isn't really paying attention. He doesn't care. So one way to show that is just, I guess, like what's happening here. It's um, talking about something arbitrary, uh, kind of mundane, or doesn't have anything to do with the plot, but it also gives you a sense of the frame of mind where the character is. It's like Quentin Tarantino, where they're just kind of talking about nonsense, but kind of like getting bits and pieces of the character Yeah. <laughs> Where am I?
I still find this whole section really weird because I don't think Nick is present for it, but we're getting a lot of details for, you know, so. Yeah, I don't know. If someone understands how this structure can pass, <laughs> um, let me know. I mean, it's fine. I'm understanding everything fine. I just think it's interesting. It's the whole story. <clears throat> it's told through Nick's perspective. But here we are. I'm still having <clears throat> such a hard time spelling her name. <laughs> Myrtle. Tricky. I think it's the RTL. Maybe the Y. Feel it. It's intensifying. The pace is picking up. This was what I was waiting for, really. And you can notice that um, they're going back and forth a lot without having to use the dialogue tags. Just when a kind of a new character steps in. It's always interesting to see how it, when you're reading, you, you don't really notice it, but when you're typing it out, you can see where he chooses not to use anything.
sure to him. This Michaelis guy is not a not a really good detective, huh? <laughs> How could she There's a lot of uh, subtext happening here. Things that are being communicated. Um, a lot of, I think, assumptions and hypotheses and theories are being presented and no one's really ready to like say it out loud. But it's kind of what it's doing for the reader is like the reader is kind of a part of it like it's like wait what kind of trying to figure it out themselves which I think is a fun thing you could do for your readers is to not give them all the information right away not make it super clear and they just have to kind of trust that at the end you're gonna tell them what it is that's really happening, what the characters are really thinking, and they could come together even though uh, you as a reader are making your own predictions, which is what I'm doing right now as I'm typing. I don't really remember the end of the story, so I'm like, wait, who is he talking about? Is he talking about Gatsby? Is he talking about Tom? Who is, what, what is he like plotting to do? And in my brain, I'm kind of piecing it together and jumping to my own conclusion. I feel as clueless as this Michaelis guy, in a way. I'm kind of living through this Michaelis character, which I now see I've spelt his name wrong. <laughs> right, um, and um, yeah, and it just feels like we're all part of this mystery together, even though you kind of, because we know what really happened. It's like, you know, Daisy and Gatsby hit Myrtle with the car. We know that, but we don't know what these people know. It's an interesting way to be, present the story. It's through confusion at this stage, as opposed to confusion later on. The, what is it called? Dramatic irony, where the reader knows something that the characters don't know. That's what's happening right now. One thing I've discovered while uh, working on this project is sometimes it takes a while for my thoughts to form in my head and I start talking too early. Like I'm just like, okay, here's this idea. And then I just start saying it, but it's kind of just this jumble mess of ideas, like unedited. I don't really know what I'm saying. Kind of what's happening right now, actually. And it's through me just talking it out that I actually like, okay, all right, here, in conclusion, this was the actual thought. It's like a too long, didn't read version. It's like, if you just take the last couple of sentences of what I'm talking about, that's the most important thing. But it's this process that is kind of uh, thinking, speaking, and, uh, yeah, you don't really know how you think until you try to articulate it and realize, whoa, you you don't know what you're talking about. So that's something I've discovered throughout this whole thing. It's just how I gotta just kind of take time and allow the idea to fully form, even though I'm like speaking about it and I sound like an idiot. It's just to get over that. 
it's, that's, how, that's how I get better at articulating my thoughts. Or I'm just an idiot, who knows. Also, we're a small what? What? We must find out. No. Gray clouds. <laughs> despite how I actually feel about the scene, I think this scene actually does a good job of balancing everything you want for some, for like drama, you know? There's the characters, you, you kind of like, you get a little bit of the character's features, you get a little bit of what the characters are talking about, you kind of have a good idea of how they feel about the situation, and then now and then it just brings it out and you get to um, just get a sense of the setting that you're in as well. So it's like this reading is so different from watching a movie that way because you're kind of diving in and out of the scope and you're changing angles, you're focusing on different things. When you're watching something, it's just everything's in front of you. And it's, it's just so different. Like that right so when you're writing you're kind of orchestrating this this movement that happens in the brain where you're going okay now I'm the characters are talking you kind of you have it in the back of your mind you know where you are but that's not really what you're focused on it's strange and I think this uh, section does a good job of moving through the changes like that's that's the thing right you don't want it to seem too jarring and i think it's all motivated through the character's action as opposed to just like like this one for example it says wilson's glazed eyes turned out to the ash heap um instead of just a small gray cloud took on fantastic shapes over the ash heaps it's kind of character motivated as opposed to just like the author or the narrator telling you um, there's a reason for it. I don't know what the reason is. The reason is just so you get a sense of the feeling that the character is going through, probably feeling gray clouds, you get a sense of, oh, it's sad. It's a sad day. They're small. So there, Wilson feels small. But it's weird, it's a fantastic shape. It's very strange. This might be an interesting thing to happen. And um, it's kind of windy, just a little light wind. Just as like, just a little thing to, you know, a nuisance. Yeah, I don't know, I'm just making this up as I talk.
food. You may food me. But you can't food God. It's interesting because they were talking about the church earlier. And now they're talking about God. And it's like, do you actually believe in God? I don't know. It was just like a threat. Like an empty threat that you make. It's like... It's interesting. It's interesting. Wow, this is so interesting. <laughs> it's when, <laughs> when you're like talking to someone and you're telling someone about this really mundane story and even while you're saying, telling the story, you're like, this is fucking dumb. <laughs> this is boring. And then the person listening to you is trying to be nice and they're like, oh, yeah, ah, interesting. <laughs> You just want to say, no, it's not interesting. This is bullshit small talk. Please leave. Leave me alone. Or maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just how I feel when I'm saying words. Maybe they are interested. Maybe they are interested about my commute to work this morning. Not this morning, because working from home still. Working from home still. Is this optometrist? Is that what it is? The DJ? That's the design thing, right? Ah, I see. There's a symbolism happening here. It's like this. <laughs> the, the eyes of Dr. TJ Eckelberg represents the eyes of God. Eh, I think that's very clever, actually. And it's. <laughs> God sees everything. <laughs> Fitzgerald, you've done it again. Every time one of these new sections starts, I'm just like hating it. I'm just like, oh, why? why are these characters talking about? Why? Why does any of this matter? I mean, it's well written, but it's also like kind of, oh, gosh. <laughs> I see why this is a classic. Um. Uh, but then it gets to the end and it just like wraps up so nicely. I, I always feel like, oh, this, this alone, just the way it ends, it could be um, like a short story of itself. It's just so nicely structured. And this, this one particularly, it's like, oh, this is so sad. It's just this man just kind of dealing with the aftermath and now, now he's kind of being petty, <laughs> I suppose. It's, I don't know if he's being petty. I don't know if that's the right word, but he's kind of like, you should have seen this coming. Maybe a little bit vindicated. It's like, you shouldn't be cheating on me. God knows. God knows the horrible things you did. Um, I was running up here. But just wrapped up so nicely. And it called back like this reference before without having now gone into detail. That's one of the things that I feel like for me, just as this not so confident writer that I am, I often feel like, uh, is the reader gonna like 
catch on that this Dr. T.J. Eckelberg thing. Like I'm sure a lot of people who read it would have just completely missed missed that reference back to the the old advertisement. It doesn't go out and say like this is the billboard and describe it all over again. It's just like little cues. It has faith that the reader, me, is smart enough to make that connection. I think that's something we all need to have the confidence to do, right? To meet the uh, the reader halfway and not hold their hand through all of it. Where did you go? What's going on here? <laughs> this is the weird thing about this whole book is that Fitzgerald chose to, you know, spend oops, I just ripped uh, two, three, four, I'll say five pages just 
you know, in that garage, in that setting, just having these like not super important conversations. And then all of a sudden this part where George Wilson is trying to hunt down the car just skips through in like two paragraphs. What's up with that? It's like the action scenes. He just like goes through. Why why didn't he have um, multiple scenes, like a montage of him uh, knocking on doors or like snooping in? Like why why not? Why not? Instead of just this like quick. I mean, it's a it's a longer paragraph, but kind of just goes through it really quickly. interesting choice right I guess he wanted to put us in George Wilson's frame of mind that he's gonna he's already kind of acting crazy thinking crazy thoughts thinking thoughts about like God's will or whatever and then now all of this seems motivated as opposed to um, just jumping right into this without having any of the previous five pages to kind of kind of back up his action you know it gives us a sense of who is now doing this this craziness um yeah yeah there's that okay um i think this is a good time to take a little break and talk about Fitzgerald fun fact uh, last week I skipped it I'm sure some of you were upset about that um, <laughs> and this one's good this one's good also upsetting also kind of yeah uh, perhaps understanding this will help us understand the author who wrote this book uh, <laughs> I, I find that helps a lot to understand a little bit about the writer like the more we know about the writer the more we can appreciate the work it's like looking at a painting it's like looking at a van gogh and you're like oh that's a beautiful picture of a sunflower well done van gogh but then you realize you kind of understand his mental state while creating it and you're like oh he's a very troubled person it's weird that he paint flowers it's just creates more depth for um, the painting. Anyway, Fitzgerald fun fact for the day. Uh, Fitzgerald, as we knew earlier from the earlier uh, Fitzgerald fun facts, Fitzgerald is named after his like second cousin removed, also the person who wrote Star Spangled Banner, something like that. Um, he's also named after another person, his deceased sister, Louise Scott Fitzgerald, who died um, before his birth. Um, so I think, so <laughs> yeah, he wrote as an adult, adult, that three months before I was born, my mother lost her other two children. I think I started then to be a writer. It's a kind of a confusing sentence but I think he's being kind of cheeky about it saying that a lot of his family trauma <laughs> and tragedies um, motivate him, motivated him to be a writer this way and so we often talk to artists and writers or anything anybody and there's often this like origin of when you wanted to like create something, you know, anybody, any profession really. Um, profession that's a, a passion, I also see. <laughs> I type this, oh gosh. It's um, what motivated you to uh, do that? And there's like, you know, hard answers I guess like uh, yeah I went to art school and I saw this performance I watched this movie I read this book and it motivated me to be a writer but then there's these soft reasons where it's like deep within your soul it's like I need to be a writer because 
this is my way of relieving this this generational trauma that I've been through. And I think that's what Gatsby's saying there. He's not saying that he started writing when he wasn't even born yet. Um, he's saying because his sister died three months before he was even born, that it probably really m messed up his mother and therefore kind of rippled out into his life, affecting it that way. And so as we look at what we're producing, especially right now, this is kind of a dark scene that's happening, we can only assume that Fitzgerald is drawing it from his, from his past somehow. It's not just wonderful, wild imagination, right? It's like we, we pull things from deep inside us. All right. I just love the idea of him just going for a swim. I'm kind of imagining, <laughs> not Gatsby, but the Leo character in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. <laughs> just him floating in the pool. Oh, she's spelling all these words wrong. feel it, something bad's gonna happen. I think one thing that is kind of paced now is you're like, uh oh, uh oh, you got we wanna warn Gatsby. Four o'clock. Kind of piecing it together now because it, it leaves, it left clues with the time. Six o'clock. Michaelis was worn out. Um, and George reached Gad's Hill about noon. Not until noon. I don't know where that is. Just trying to piece together. By half past two. Um, George Wilson was in West Egg. So at four, that's about the same time Gatsby went swimming. Okay, yeah. So this is fun. We're like piecing together um, a 
crime scene or a crime scene that's gonna happen. You one one would imagine bad things uh, unfolding real soon. Where am I? I shouldn't I shouldn't stop in the middle of sentences. All right, let's let's do it. Let's do the part of the show where I, I see how quickly I can type, how many words I can type. This has been a fun exercise, weekly exercise I do. Um, yeah, I don't know if I've ever improved. I kind of plateaued. I think I plateaued. Um, actually, that's not true. I range from like 50 to like, I think I got 80 once, like 30 words, somewhere in between. I wish I was a little more consistent, actually. I don't think I've plateaued. I just haven't been consistent. And in my defense, sometimes these words are weird. Like this, I see this one being really challenging right now. But let's go for it, because this is what I do. Okay. Oh no. I picked a bad one to do this fast. This is an intense sequence that's happening here. I kind of just like blown through it. Um, my mistake. This is a pretty intense part of the story. 65 though, 65 words, not bad. All right, let's get back to this because uh, this is important for us. No. Perceptible. 
is really well written. I couldn't even imagine writing something like this. It was a faint, barely perceptible movement of the water as the fresh flow from one end urged its way towards the drain at the other. With little ripples that were hardly the shadows of waves, the laden mattress moved irregularly down the pool. A small gust of wind that scarcely curated <laughs> Oh jeez, I shouldn't read. It, the surface was enough to disturb its accident course with its accidental burden. The touch of cluster of leaves revolved it slowly, tracing like legs of transit, a thin red circle into the water, in the water. It really creates the image in your head what's happening yeah it doesn't end with just a snap right to take a breath after after this chapter my god my god it's disorienting this chapter was the way everything kind of moved around so quickly and then fell apart I mean what a brutal ending but kind of leaves you with, an, with a not so clear idea of what happened, right? It's like, wait, is Gatsby okay? Is Wilson, Wilson, Wilson's dead? What happened? And I talked about this before and how you kind of answer a question and then you immediately have to ask another one when you're writing just to keep the momentum going when you run out of questions to answer that's kind of where the story ends in a way sort of not all of, all the time not really but here we are that's a way to end a chapter it's very impressive it's both like it's it's lacking any of the action that happened, but it forces you to sort of picture everything in your head. And that's somehow more powerful. It's like a horror story where 
you don't need to see the monster. Like the idea of the monster is a little more terrifying. That's kind of the technique that's used here, isn't it? Okay, well, that's it. That's another episode of Typing, typing the Great Gatsby. Oh God. Um, we've reached our final chapter. This is huge. This is huge. So I'll see you guys next time.